Hello, everybody. This is Jake Stenziano, host of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, here with my co-host, the multifamily mentor, the coach, the chef, the father of six, the best-selling author, the G-Daddy, Gino Barbaro. Gino, how's it going? Mr. Stenziano, I'm doing good this morning. How you doing? Always making it happen, big man. Today's guest is Tom Wheelwright. Tom is the founder and CEO of ProVision CPA Firm. He is also a well-known rich dad tax advisor and has been described as the best of the best by President-elect Donald Trump. We're going to take a deep dive into real estate and taxes today. So without further ado, Tom, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. It's, uh, it's great to be on the show. Always love talking to real estate investors. Hey, that's what we're going to be talking about today. So why don't you give us a little bit about your background and how you got started in business? Yeah, so um, I've actually, I've been, I've been teaching entrepreneurs and investors for about 35 years how to permanently reduce their taxes and started, um, started after uh, graduating with a master's degree from University of Texas, started with Ernst & Young back when it was Ernst & Winnie back in the old days. And I actually spent three years in the national office. So uh, I've got deja vu all over again because Trump's uh, tax proposals are very similar to Reagan's tax proposals when I was in Washington, D.C., so very, very similar. So uh, interesting history there. And, uh, and then I started, uh, I worked for a Fortune 500 company, was an in-house tax advisor there, and then started my firm about 20, almost 25 years ago. So we've been, uh, ever since then, we, we have clients in 50 states, six continents, 30 countries. Wow. Uh, it's, it's been a fun ride. Tom, I was just talking to you on, on the show before we started, and I was so excited to read your book. And I think you're surprised that I read your book, and I think everyone should get a copy of it because it's an awesome book. It'll tell you about taxes and not to be afraid of taxes and to embrace taxes. Can you discuss why tax law is written and who it benefits? I think that's the crux of the book for every entrepreneur. Uh, it, it, it is. What most people think about taxes is they think that taxes are primarily to raise revenue. And, and while that is certainly a use of taxes, let me give you a, a couple of numbers that might surprise you. Uh, in, income taxes, uh, the 6,000 pages of income tax code, uh, raise about $2.1 trillion a year for the U.S. government. In that Internal Revenue Code, though, which I describe as a, as, as a roadmap to reducing taxes, there are $17.1 trillion of tax benefits that are provided to people on an annual basis. So when you compare it, $17.1 trillion of benefits versus $2.1 trillion of revenue raised. So what's the primary purpose? I mean, I always say, I'm an accountant, follow the numbers, right? Mm -hmm. So, so the, the primary purpose of the law, and it has been for 50 years, has been to direct the policy of the government, whether it's in the U.S., any other country. I've been in uh, 20 countries this year, and every country, it's the same. You know, they follow this idea that, look, people hate paying taxes, so if we give them a little tax incentive, they'll do something. And, and everybody knows that because people buy a house. Why, one, one of the reasons they buy a house is because they get the more, uh, home mortgage interest deduction. What do pe why do people – why would you ever put money in a 401K or a 529 plan? The only reason you'd ever do it was for the tax benefit because it's a horrible idea. So, so everything, everything we do – there's a tax consequence to it, and all I'm saying in tax-free wealth is, you know, embrace it. Just, just say, look, what are the tax consequences that I can apply to my life that are going to improve my life by reducing my taxes? Something else really stuck in my book. We're going to get to the 401ks. I know how you love them and the real estate tax benefits. But there's another, I think, strong uh, statement you made in there. That it's not, it's not how much you own that is important, how much that you can control. Can you tell us how and why? What do you mean by that statement? Well, so, you know, you can, you can own things in your own name, and, and we're taught to, to buy things and own them, and, and ownership is kind of the, you know, we've, we've heard it's the principle of democracy and all that kind of stuff, but you don't have to own it personally. You know, you can, you can control it through entities. You can use limited liability companies. You can use partnerships. You can use corporations. You can use trusts. All of these different types of entities are set up for specific purposes under the law, and and they all have positive opportunities for us, and they all have tax consequences. So, you know, we think about corporations, we go, okay, well, you know, that's to protect myself for legal liability. But it also has tax consequences to have a corporation. And, and then you have two, you really have two primary different types of entities you, from a tax standpoint. You have those where they 
you pay a tax at that level. So that's a typical corporation. You know, Apple, Google, they pay tax at the corporate level. And then when there's a dividend, actually in the U.S., there's a second tax, which is actually unusual um, in, in, in the world. It's double taxation. Mm -hmm. then, then you have the other type of entity, which is we call a flow-through entity, which means that the, all the entity is, from a tax standpoint, is a reporting mechanism. And what it does is reports the income to the owners, and the owners actually pay the tax on their tax return. Can you jump into why you favor real estate as an investment vehicle for the before-tax returns and the after-tax returns? And what, what shelters does real estate uh, give us? Well, you know, real estate has some particular advantages under the tax law, but it, it actually has some advantages outside of the tax law, like you mm -hmm. say, before, before tax. And the big advantage of real estate is leverage. Um, you know, the disadvantage of real estate is liquidity because there's really no liquidity in real estate, as everybody found out in 2008, right? There's just no liquidity. So that's the, that's the downside, and that would be the upside of the stock market. Well, but the upside of, of, the, of real estate compared to really about any other asset is that it's really easy to get financing for it. So debt is, you know, if you think about this, you go, okay, I've got $20,000. I could buy a $20,000 property for cash or a $100,000 property with debt, which is better. Well, it, <laughs> that's not a difficult calculation. I mean, you don't have to be a CPA to make that calculation. It, you know, if it's throwing off positive income more than the, your interest expense, you're always better off using debt. So that's really what creates, uh, I think, cr that's the magic of real estate outside of taxes. It's, it's debt. And people that... You know, I, I know that there are people, uh, very famous people, who promote buying real estate with cash. I'm going. The challenge, the challenge with that one is you're lowering your returns. But the second challenge with that is you're lowering your tax benefits because not only do you leverage your 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 returns before tax, but you actually leverage your tax benefits. So, for example, the the biggest tax benefit, and I talk about this. Uh, I do a whole chapter on this, chapter seven of, of Tax Free Wealth. The whole, the, the whole big tax benefit in real estate is called depreciation. So, so we don't ever expect, I mean, it does happen, as we know, 2008. We don't expect our real estate to go down in value. We expect it to go up in value. Nevertheless, we get a tax benefit equal to the wear and tear, let's say, on the real estate. And on the contents of the real estate, on the land improvements, everything about it. And what happens is, is that this, this is something that, it's based on what we pay for the property. So go back to my example of 20000 versus 100000 So if, if I buy a $20,000 property, I get depreciation or a percentage of that 20000 as a deduction every year. And done right, should be should be about 10% for the first five years. Okay, so I get about a $2,000 deduction. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that, that's great. But if I have a $100,000 property... The bank doesn't get the depreciation deduction. I get the depreciation deduction. But instead of two thousand, now I'm at ten thousand. So I've gone from a two thousand dollar deduction to ten thousand dollar deduction. Well, people who buy real estate for cash typically end end up paying tax on the income from the real estate. People who buy real estate using debt never pay tax mm -hmm. on their real estate. And and we have other tax benefits as well. Which, given a a president elect who is a real estate mogul. We would not expect these to change, at least not to, to, to the detriment of real estate investors. You know, we have these like-kind exchanges. And like-kind exchange means that I can sell my property, buy another property, upgrade to another property, and not pay any tax. And I can do that forever. And then when I die, actually, my tax, because we have an estate tax, by the way, that would be the downside of getting rid of the estate tax. Because we have an estate tax, my, my, my income tax actually goes away when I die. So we have an opportunity in real estate to never pay taxes on the income and to never pay taxes on the gain. It's a really the only pure tax-free investment. Jake, we like that. And one of the things that Rich Dad says, the three tenets of a great investment are leverage, liquidity, and control. And I think uh, real estate gives you the leverage and the control. And Jake and I would like to say, I think it gives you a little liquidity sometimes because you can refi the property. And the downside of having liquidity is you can do something stupid where you can sell something too soon, like hitting a button on a stock and just gone. And so sometimes it's good not to have that liquidity. I, you know, I, I push back on that sometimes because maybe it makes you take a long-term horizon. It makes you think of the end in mind. So sometimes Sometimes not having that liquidity actually works to your benefit. So yeah, um, yeah. just just throwing that I, in. There. I, you know what? I, I I think that's fair. I I am very strategic. I mean, 
name of my company is Provision Wealth Strategists. Mm-hmm. So you know, s- strategy is 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 really part of what we do, and. St- you know, this strategy, this long-term plan of action is critical when you're investing. It doesn't matter what you're investing in. I think you're right. I think that people who invest in the, in the stock market, particularly if they're in the traditional buy, hold, and pray strategy, um, you know, just buy it, hold it, pray that it goes up, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Typically, that, that strategy, people don't think a lot about it. They don't, they don't invest the time. They don't take, take the energy to get the education. You know, it doesn't matter what you're investing in. You've got to get the education. But I think you're right. I think that it's just too easy to get in and out of it. And and like this time of year, we're going to see people getting out of the stock market when they maybe shouldn't. We're going to see people staying in the stock market when maybe they shouldn't. And mm-hmm. some of that, you're right. I think it's because of liquidity. You know, the 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 thing about liquidity is if we focus on cash flow and not appreciation, we don't worry so much about liquidity because right. if we've got good solid cash flow in our real estate, then if, if we have a dip in the market, as long as our, our rents are enough that we can handle that dip because in 2008, we didn't see just a dip in value. We saw a dip in rents. And as long as we, you know, as long as we're not thin, you know, I mean, this is just good investing principles, right? Don't be yep. thin in your cash flow. Uh, and and people got caught up in appreciation. If you if you're investing for capital gain, you're 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 going to get hammered at some point in your life. I agree with that. And this is a great segue because you talk a lot about in the book why you don't prefer the traditional vehicles as, as 401ks or I know you like Roth IRAs, but the regular IRAs, even self-directed IRAs holding real estate. Can you speak to that a little bit? Why you dis? I wouldn't say. Hammer them, but you dislike them. <laughs> I'm happy to hammer them. Uh, <laughs> okay, good, good. I do too. So <laughs> you know, I, I I've been uh, my my specialty in tax has been real estate almost since day one. Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, real estate and oil and gas are my two specialties. Uh, from an industry standpoint, I started my career in Utah um, during the oil and gas boom days of the 1980s, and um, my my technical specialty is partnerships and real estate, of course, is done in partnerships. And so I, you know, I just gotten really involved in real estate and, you know, real, real estate just has, there, there's, there's, there's some magic to it. I mean, there, there's just no other way to put it. I, I just think there's some magic to real estate in every way, shape and form. Mm-hmm. So uh, the traditional 401ks, what do you think that, what, what, what do you dislike about them as far as tax standpoints? Cause so, I'm, so, so, so the problem with the, the problem with thank you for bringing me back to that, you know, because <laughs> <laughs> I want you to hammer them. That's why cause Jake and I took a bomb to and we blew our four hundred one k's up. So I have to like actually make myself feel good. All right. Well, let, let me let me let me let, let me put it very simply. So when we were in grade school, we all learned that uh, when probably third grade we were doing our multiplication tables, and that's when we graduated from positive multiplication to negative multiplication. And we said, look, if you take negative one and you multiply it by negative one, you have a positive one. Okay, right? Negative times a negative is a positive. Well, that doesn't always work to our benefit. Let's say you've got real estate, which is a tax shelter, but probably best tax shelter in the world in any country. And you put it into a 401k, which is another tax shelter. What you do is you end up taking a tax shelter, uh, a, a, an asset, an investment that should never be taxable, should never, ever pay tax on real estate. By putting it into a 401k, you've converted it to a taxable transaction because when it's in that 401k, when it comes out, it's going to be taxed at ordinary income rates. Mm-hmm. Second of all, you lose your leverage because everybody knows that banks do not like lending to 401ks. They don't like lending to IRAs because you cannot personally guarantee that loan. And if you're doing a, you know, a small loan uh, like a single family home or a fourplex or something like that, or you're just starting out – you're gonna. The bank's gonna require you to personally guarantee that loan. You cannot do that. It is illegal for you to do that in a 401k or an IRA. Mm-hmm. So you can't get the leverage. So you've lost the debt. Plus, think about this: in if you're leveraging properly your real estate, you're not just getting a tax benefit by not paying tax on the income from the real estate. You're actually probably generating losses from the real estate, just paper losses, that can offset income from other businesses and other investments. Okay, so that's actually a, a positive tax benefit. That actually increases your rate of return on your real estate. You lose all that. Mm-hmm. Even in a Roth 401k, you lose all that. Plus, I think they're very dangerous. Um, I, I know you've had uh, Garrett Sutton on the show, right? Yep. 
So, yeah. so, so <laughs> Garrett and I teach this on a regular basis. And, and what Garrett hates is he doesn't like self-directed IRAs in the first place because people tend to make mistakes with them. OK, especially these so-called checkbook IRAs where they actually allow you to write a check on them. Um, the, the challenge is the IRS prohibits any services rendered by you to your IRA. OK, well, think about it. OK, so you've got investment real estate. So you're not going to any, render any services. You're not going to manage that investment. You're not going to you know, call a property manager. You're not going to you're not you're going to seriously let some IRA administrator handle your property for you. I mean. To me, that's just a recipe for disaster. That's the number one reason I liquidated all my funds that I had out there in the the Roth and the four hundred and one k because I'm too active. I'm too active in it, and they wouldn't have. I couldn't have, you know, done a self directed. That's the number one reason that I that I just said I'm not going to do it. Yeah. You know, and and here's here's another thought for you. Okay, so let's let's think about a four hundred and one k for a minute. Okay, who who determines how much you can put into a four hundred and one k and when you can put it in? The I was government. Just about to say that the government. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Who determines how much you can put in? Government. Who determines what you can invest in? Oh, you know, I guess that's is that going to be that's going to be you at some point, no? Because that would be the government, isn't it? The government, the government yeah, well, you're determines what you can, you can invest the funds, in. Though, I guess what I was mm, saying, but, but the government determines gotcha. what you can invest in. Fair okay, enough. you can't invest in certain things. Some oh, I things gotcha, you can. I, gotcha. I, I was some thinking of the, I was thinking mutual fund, but I got gotcha. you. So, Fair enough. Yeah, but the government says, okay, put it in the stock market, right? That's right. what the government says. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So the government's determining when you put it in. Who determines when you can take it out? Government. The government. The government. And half, okay. Right. And if you don't, and if you don't take it out at the right time, who determines if? So, and, and not only that, do they determine you can only take it out once you turn 50 and a half? You take it out before you pay a penalty. Plus, if you don't take it out, if you leave it in too long, you also have a penalty. That's right. At so, 70 and a half, you're right. So, my mom so here's he, here's my point. If you're not going to get any financial education, do a 401k, invest in mutual funds. I mean, that, that would be my recommendation. If you're getting no education, if you're not listening, you know, if, I mean, of course, that's not a, your listeners because listeners here, they're getting education right now. If you're not going to do that, that's fine. But if you're interested in actually getting education and you're willing to take steps to, to increase your rates of return on investment, to reduce your risk, to have more control, why would you ever put your money in a 401k? Plus, with debt increasing, national debt increasing, and you know, the likelihood of taxes going up in the future, right? Who, wh who's going to say what the tax rate is going to be when you're pulling that, uh, pulling that out, right? Well, you know, right. so, so, so you make a good point. So the argument of the financial planning community for the 401k, of course, they're arguing that so that they can, you can invest in mutual funds that mm -hmm. they sell you, right? But the argument for that is that you're going to be in a lower tax bracket when you retire, Yes. Well, that is that argument only flies if your goal of retirement is to retire poor. Mm -hmm. Because if your goal of retirement is to have as much money when you retire as when you were working, you're going to be in a higher tax bracket, not a lower tax bracket. You will never be in a lower tax bracket because a it's ordinary income. Okay, so you can't manage the type of the the, the tax on the income. Okay, and and b you don't have all the deductions you used to have. I mean, think about it. You don't have your business deductions. You, right. you know, it, it, you don't have, you, you probably paid off your house. Right. You don't have that deduction. If you're kids super, if you're super lucky, your kids have gone. Okay. <laughs> Not so Gino. you don't have that. If you don't have that deduction, Hey, Gino, do you have any boys? I have one boy. Yeah. One out of okay, six. So just so you know, the girls leave. The boys always come back. They, That's good. You know, I got they, one. They, thank God. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll get the one. He'll come back. You'll be supporting him for the rest of his life, the rest of your <laughs> life. Uh, just so you know, I have two of them, and uh, they, 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 they're, they're like um, a bad penny. You know, they just keep coming back. But uh, sounds like he's got but, some but, millennial basement dwellers there. <laughs> seriously, totally, totally, T two of them. So no, no, they're 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 awesome. But um, but. But you think about that, and, you go, and, and people go, yeah, well, I won't have a mortgage payment, so I won't need as much money. I'm going, what, you're going to golf at the municipal golf course? Okay, you're going to go to the discount theater? I mean, what do you want to do in your retirement, right? I mean, no don't you want to go to first-run movies? Don't you want to, you know, travel first class? Don't you want to play PGA P, PGA quality golf courses? I mean, I just don't understand this idea that my goal in life is to not be live on a park bench. Yeah. You know, I, I mean, for me... I think for anybody listening to this to this um, podcast, I would think everybody here wants to retire rich. 
And I've never met anybody in the world that didn't want to retire rich. And if you're going to retire rich, why would you ever, ever be, be, be reliant on a 401k or a stock market over which you have no control? But it's I beaten totally into our that. head, you know. When so I got out of college, I you know I got into pharmaceutical sales, and everyone was, well, you gotta you gotta put your money somewhere, right? So I started at the time. Okay, I'm gonna get a 401k. I'm gonna get a Roth. I'm you know, gonna get rich. We all it. do that. But that's but it's just beaten your head. So until you start to educate yourself, you have no idea what else is out there, and that's why you know I got trapped into it for a few years, and I said, all right, liquidating, pulling out, and now I'm here. So and you know why I'm excited to have you on, Tom, because everyone comes to the realization that they're doing something stupid like Jake when they read Rich Dad Poor Dad. Everyone <laughs> has right. a shift, and it's like I read Rich Dad Poor Dad. Everybody on this podcast doing, will always man? say, "Out of ten people, my house is not an asset." For one, you know, and it's just like wow, exactly. that is like the like the shining moment. And hopefully, you can get that book before you're 30, before you start making these mistakes. And if you do, anytime, it's never the wrong time to start. That's my point. So um, it's exciting to have you on because you're part of that whole, I guess, movement. And I think it's exciting to you know to talk about this stuff. You know, no, it's it's a lot of fun, and it's worldwide. Uh, you know, it's it was interesting. Yep. I was uh, we were actually in in Bishkek. Kyrgyzstan this year, Robert and I, we were, we're flying home, we go through security, and everybody in security, all of, I, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about the people flying, I'm talking about the, 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 the security agents, they want selfies with Robert. I bet. <laughs> they all awesome. know him. Uh -huh. it, is, it is amazing. Mm -hmm. It is amazing how well uh, how well known this guy is around the world. And it doesn't matter. We were in Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, uh, Russia, Ukraine, I mean, People, I mean, this is, this is, it's just, a, it's, it, the reason I think that people love it is because it resonates with their soul, okay? Because Rich Dad Poor Dad is not, there's, you know, there's no content there, right? I mean, yeah, everybody who thinks about it goes, well, wait a minute, it doesn't tell me how to do this. Not relevant. What it is, it's, it's an inspiration to our soul to change yeah our lives, to change the way we Shit. think about things. Yep. And, 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 you know, the best thing um, you, you said to me um, all, all day so far is that tax-free wealth will shift, change your thought process, change right. how you think about taxes, that you can embrace the tax law. I mean, th think about this. If, if literally I, I was doing a, I was doing my, my own webinar last night to my people and um, we were talking about how the tax law actually we were actually talking about debt, as, as it turns out. We were talking about debt. And, you, you know, Rich Dad Poor Dad talks about good debt and bad debt, right? So good debt is debt where you buy assets, and bad debt is debt where you buy liabilities, right? So you buy a house, that's bad debt. You buy a car, that's bad debt. You know, you buy an investment property, that's good debt. You buy a business, that's good debt because it's putting money in your pocket, right? Well, mm -hmm. think about this. The tax law actually promotes that. If you buy, if you have good debt, you get to deduct the interest. If you have bad debt, you don't. Home mortgage interest is the only exception to that. So the the, the tax law, actually, if you follow the tax law, it, it won't just reduce your taxes. It'll actually help you build wealth because it's a very good guideline for building wealth. The tax law, want, because remember, what, the, what does the government want? The government wants to create jobs. They want to create housing. They want to improve the economy. And they, that's what they use the tax law for primarily. Okay, so if you're following the tax law the way it's meant to be followed, you're actually going to make more money. That's great. I, I'm trying to teach my, my son that between personal and business debt. Personal debt is something we don't want, and business debt is something that we want to embrace. And he said something to me the other day, Jake. I think you'd be proud of it. He owes me 50, 40 bucks, right? So it's eating at him. I'm like, what's the matter? He goes, I don't want to owe anybody any money. I'm like, hallelujah. It's go, it's working, right? Because that's the personal side. And he's giving me money to invest in our next property. So all you parents out there, start trading your children. It's up to you to teach them the difference between personal debt and business debt. Uh, you lever your, your personal life through your business. And I think Tom illustrated that beautifully what he just said so that's the power of taxes you know um i want to ask you about cost segregation could you give us a i mean a, maybe a minute overview of how sure. it works what it looks like because it's really important uh part of our strategy yeah no it, it, it it's it's very very important and, and people you know here's what happens with cost segregation i was actually um watching a uh uh a community. Um, this was a, a kind of a, a blog back and forth where people, uh, this was CPAs actually, my profession, and they were talking about cost segregations. And the question was, is it legal? Is it, is it, is an audit risk, et cetera? And I'm just watching this. And I'm going, really? And you people are licensed? I mean, so, so let me explain first of all what cost segregation is. And let me, then we'll, let me explain what it isn't. Great. Okay. 
So, so cost segregation, when you buy a property, you're really buying fundamentally four things. You're buying the land, you're buying the building, you're buying everything that's inside the building, and you're buying everything that's on the land, okay? All the land improvements, okay? Now, the, the tax law actually treats all four of those things differently. Okay, land, even the IRS knows, and, and even they're smart enough to know that land does not wear out. So there's no deduction ever for land. There's no depreciation deduction for land. Buildings were out over a very long period of time. The IRS has decided that that period is somewhere between 27 and a half years for um, uh, residential property and it's 39 years for commercial property. That's just an arbitrary number that, that, that they came up with years ago. Now, that's the building, but we also have the contents of the building. Well, okay, so let's say you've got multifamily housing, okay, and you've got a bunch of um, cabinets, and you've got window coverings, you've got floor coverings, and you've got, you know, anybody who's ever um, owned <laughs> residential property knows that these things do not last very long, all right? I mean, they get hammered by the tenants, right? And they're not going to mm -hmm. last probably more than five years. And so there's a five-year depreciation rate on these things, okay? And then on the land improvements, they also don't last that long. You're talking about fencing and landscaping and, and, and covered parking, stuff like that. So that's tends that under the IRS guidelines is 15 years. What it, that means is the, the shorter the year, the faster the depreciation, the higher the depreciation rate. Well, so how do you break out the difference in what you paid for that property between the land, the building, the contents, and the land improvements? That's called a cost segregation. You're just segregating the cost between those four things. Now, here's what you have to do. You must hire a professional to do this. IRS audit guidelines require a CPA and or an engineer. We actually, when, when, we, when we refer out, we refer to, to um, people who do both. Okay, they do both, they're, they're both, they have both CPAs and, and engineers on staff. Okay, that's very important because the engineers, you know, go in and look at the drawings, all that kind of stuff, and CPAs have to categorize the stuff. Okay, so that's, that's basically what you're doing. You're just hiring them. Now, now a good cost segregation expert, by the way, will tell you how much the tax savings will be, be ever, before they ever charge you a dime or en enroll you in a contract. So it's, it's a no-brainer. I mean, it's a little bit of time to get them the information, but why wouldn't you do that? Now, here's what it isn't. It, it, it isn't a red flag on your tax return. In fact, a cost segregation under the law technically is required. Okay, now the IRS doesn't. The IRS doesn't require it. The law does. The IRS has just said, we won't require it, but the law technically requires a cost segregation. So it's not an audit risk, okay? <laughs> and in fact, it, it's an audit risk if you don't do it right. Don't get me wrong. I mean, if you just arbitrarily say, well, I'm going to yeah. take, you know, 20% allocate it to contents and 15% and, and allocate the leasehold improvements and, you know, 30% allocate the land, you, you do arbitrary numbers there. All right, now, now you've got an audit risk. But if you use a professional, you actually have less of an audit risk than you. And, and not only that, think about this. So you can do a cost segregation at any time during the period you own the property. This is something very few people understand. You do not have to do it the year you buy it. So let's say you bought a property five years ago. And you you've all, what most CPAs do is without a cost segregation, what are you going to do? You're going to allocate it between land and building. That's it. So you're, you're, typically what I see all the time, I'll see 20% to land, 80% to the building. Okay, five years down the road, you, you, know, you, you get some good advice. You go, oh, I need to do a cost segregation. So you hire somebody to do this cost segregation. Well, now they actually go back in time and said, what would have been the depreciation? Had I been depreciating it properly over the last five years? That adjustment, that difference between what you should have done cumulatively and what you did do, is actually a deduction in the year you do the cost segregation. So that means that you actually get to write off all that five-year property in the year you do the cost segregation because it should have been fully depreciated by then, and you were depreciating like 2.5% a year. So you get this huge tax benefit, and you can determine when you want to do it. So you go, okay, I don't, I, I, I don't need the tax benefit now. I'll do it next year. Or I'll do it two years from now. This is something where you can do, you talk about strategy, Gino. Yeah. You can strategically, as I was talking to a client just last night, just last night, I'm talking to a client. He's got, he's got um, two properties and he's going, 
do I use the cost segregation in 2016 or 2017? I said, let's wait until you do your tax return. And then we'll know. We'll know exactly, you know, how much do we need to get to where we want to go. We've got, this, we've got this time frame available to us. You know, the IRS gives us 10 months to file our tax return, nine months in a partnership, right? But they mm -hmm. give us nine, nine, 10 months to file a tax return. That's plenty of time to figure out, okay, what's my taxable income? Do I want to do a cost segregation or not this year? And when you do it, do you know it's actually a change from an incorrect method of accounting to a correct method of accounting? So... So I, I want to get this through is that people, you know, CPAs all the time are telling and, and other tax advisors are telling their clients, this is risky to do a cost segregation. If, if, if somebody tells you that, you just need to run. Okay, <laughs> just run away. All Why right? are they doing uh, that? The, well, I, I have a theory. My theory is, is that anything that we don't know is risky to us. Scares us. Right. So yeah, you're afraid. We're, we're afraid of it because it, it is risky, okay, because we don't know about it, right? I mean, if, you have, if, if I were driving in um, the Indianapolis 500, that would be risky because I, you know, I, I like to drive, but I've never done that before. Right. So that would be risky because I don't know that, okay? But Danica Patrick does it, no big deal, right? I mean, so it's, it's just a matter of what's risky and, and what's not. It's a matter of your education and your experience. So, you know, people ask me all the time, so, so Tom... You talk about your, your firm. How, how aggressive is your firm? And going, we are the most conservative CPA firm in the world. We just understand more of the law. <laughs> I like so, for, mm -hmm. uh, so for us, none of what we do is risky because we're not going to do anything. I have to sign that tax return. You go to prison. I go with you. I don't. That's I don't want right. to be any. I, I'm, you know, one of my goals in life is never be anybody's girlfriend. So <laughs> that's a good goal, actually. I'm going to put that on my list. <laughs> so, 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 so I'm not going to send that tax return either. Okay. So we're going to. But, but the more you understand, the less risk there is. I mean, it's like real estate. Is it, in, is it risk? How many people tell you it's risky to invest in real estate? Well, yeah, if you're an idiot, yeah. it is risky to invest in real estate. If you don't understand what you're doing, it is risky. Debt's risky. Yes, if you don't understand what you're doing, it's very risky. Don't do it if you don't understand what you're doing. But once you understand what you're doing, now all of a sudden that risk goes down, and actually there's risk not to do it. Mm-hmm. I see Jake drooling over there because of cost seg. That, that's great advice, and I see the wheels turning over there. I love, how, I love how he explained it. It was, it was fantastic, yeah. and basically get the right team members on board, and you can be fine, right? Mm -hmm. I, no, oh, it I, is. I, I see him strategizing because we have to. We have a couple of cost <laughs> segs. Like, okay, what am I waiting? I, I can see the wheels turning. I'm, I'm his half brother now, so I know what he's thinking. <laughs> that's he's awesome. Thinking. So, um, you know, you're talking about you know all the qualities of a good tax preparer. You you laid them out in the book so well. I was wondering if you could share some of those qualities because a lot of our students go well. All right, I want a good tax preparer, but what should I look for? What what, what are the qualities that make? All right. Well, thanks for asking that. That's actually the first thing when when Robert um, Kiyosaki asked me to write the book. Uh, he, he he wanted me to focus on that because that's a question that both of us get all the time. Okay, when when we're on stage, uh, we're always, uh, the first question I'm only, always going to get is how do I find a good tax preparer? How do I find a good tax advisor? And that's why chapter 23. That's all it is. It's just mm -hmm. how do you find a good tax advisor? Well, um, you know, Robert, when when he asked me, he said, "Why don't you give us the top 10 questions that you should ask when interviewing a tax advisor?" And I'm going. Well, I can do that, and I did, I did that at the end of Chapter 23. I said, but there's something more important, and that is the top 10 questions that they should be asking you. Yep. Because he, here's, what, here's what I think we miss and actually most tax advisors miss. Um, I can't do anything about your tax situation. You're the only one who can do something about your tax situation. And your tax situation, the, the tax law is ultimately fair because anybody in a – if you take a particular fact pattern, if 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 Gino, you know, if you and Jake are in the exact same situation, you will pay the exact same tax. Okay, so it's fair based on your facts and circumstances. Well, so what do, what does an advisor need to know? An advisor needs to know your facts and circumstances. So the more digging, you know, it's like you go to a doctor. What's the first thing the doctor does? It diagnoses that he diagnoses the problem. Right? That's the first thing a tax advisor should be doing is diagnosing the problem. Okay, what's, you know, where, where's the pain? All right, where does it hurt? Right? I mean, how do you feel here? You know, the, you know do you have a tickle in your throat? You know, you know l let me look at this, right? That's what, a good, that's what a good advisor does. It doesn't matter if you're a legal advisor, a tax advisor, financial advisor, a, a health advisor. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. 
You mm-hmm. gotta ask the good questions. So the job of the advisor is to ask questions, not to give answers. Because you got all the answers. I don't have any of the answers. You have them. So I have to ask you the right questions. It, 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 and, and let me give you an example of, of the right question and the wrong question. So the question I get all the time is, I'll get, okay, uh, let's see, if, if, if I go on a trip, is that deductible? I'm going, it's the wrong question. I can't even possibly begin to answer that question. But what? here's the right question. If I go on a trip, how do I make it deductible? That's the right question. Mm-hmm. Okay. Because everything's deductible in every country. Everything's deductible in every country under the right facts and circumstances, okay? You just have to do it the right way. We, we actually had a guy, so we're, we're in uh, Chile um, in uh, May this year, and uh, we're, Robert, Robert gets me on stage and he says, so teach him how to deduct a Bentley. And I'm laughing because there's a Bentley on the to, to the side of the stage is a Bentley because the Bentley and Lamborghini dealer was the primary sponsor of this event. So we have a Bentley and Lamborghini right there next to us on stage. Of course, Robert owns both a Bentley and a Lamborghini, right? So he loves this. And I, so I, I go through and I explain why how you can deduct a Bentley. So then um, I get this attorney tax. This attorney comes up to me at lunch and he says, "You can't do that here." And we get that everywhere. I, I, I could be in Phoenix, Arizona, and I'd get, you can't do that here. And, you know, my response, of course, is I, I'm the youngest of six children, so you'll understand this, Gino. My response is, no, you can't do this here. <laughs> you know, uh-huh. right? I uh-huh. can do this here. You can't do this here because you don't understand how to do this here. Mm-hmm. But, but what was interesting is, so, so, so the next day, I'm, I'm telling Robert about this, and he goes, okay, so, so the, the law actually in Chile is you can't deduct automobile expense in a business. So that's, you know, he was coming from a, a reasonable place, right? Mm-hmm. So Robert, <laughs> Robert the next day says, all right, so given that, tell him how to deduct a Bentley. And we got up and we actually, we actually figured out on stage how to deduct a Bentley in a country where it's illegal to deduct automobile expense. And it's just a different way of thinking. When you say rich dad, poor dad, it's just changing the thought process. That's what we have to do. And that's why I love traveling with Robert because, you know, I'm always learning new things about, you know, how, how to think about this. But that's, that's when it comes down to an advisor. And, and again, it doesn't matter if it's a tax advisor, legal advisor, real estate advisor, it doesn't matter. Okay. The, the issue, what you really are looking for in my mind is asking the right questions. When I go to a doctor, I want a doctor who asks me the right questions because then I can get somebody who can, if they're asking me the right questions, first of all, it's pretty easy to tell if somebody's asking you good questions. It's pretty hard to tell if they're giving you good answers because if, if, if you knew if they were giving you good answers, you wouldn't need to ask a question in the first place because you already knew the answer. Mm-hmm. But we're, but we're pretty well, we're, I think we're pretty well trained to know what a good question is. And, you know, if you just start with this idea that is this deductible? Wrong question. How do I make it deductible? Better question. So it's always, a, how do I get to a better question? And to me, that's what a tax advisor is about. And also make sure, one, one other thing, you know, people have this idea that a tax preparer and tax advisor, um, same, same thing. They should be the same thing. But most tax preparers are not tax advisors. All tax advisors for the most part, are tax preparers. So so do I want a tax preparer who may or may not be a tax advisor or a tax advisor that I know is a tax preparer? I, I want somebody who does both things because what people don't recognize is that there's literally hundreds of things we can do on your tax return to reduce your taxes. So if you're not a, if you don't have a tax advisor mentality that I'm trying to reduce your taxes and I'm just putting numbers on a form, I mean, seriously, I can train a monkey to put numbers on a form, right? And they can do a better job right, than a lot of tax preparers. Mm-hmm. But I can't train a monkey how to think about reducing your taxes. That's what a professional tax advisor is for, and that's why your tax advisor, tax preparer, should always be the same person. And I'm going to keep going back to your book again because something that resonated in the book, you said every expense that you generate in a business deduction has to go towards creating revenue. So simple things like that will make your mind shift into saying, listen, Think of an expenses, try to, like you said, going on vacation. Well, if you're going on vacation to Florida, make sure you have some investment property. Maybe you, maybe you like to invest there. So it just makes you shift your mind and maybe it doesn't, you don't know how to do the investment, but at least start thinking down that path and start planning your life that way. That's what I love about well, the book. Well, 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 let me give you an example. I, I give you a real life example. I, I, I had a client, um, his name is John, and uh, he wanted to learn how to deduct his travel to New Mexico. 
And because uh, he, he and his wife go there, uh, you know, Me- New Mexico. I don't know if you've been there before. It's absolutely beautiful. Beautiful, yeah. Beautiful, beautiful place. Beautiful mountains. So he'd, he, they, they'd been going for years. And I, so I give him I, just what you said, you know. All right, you need to spend time, do, you know, doing business in New Mexico. You have to spend more than half your time, uh, half your day doing business, doing business. And his business was real estate, as it turns out. He was a, he was a, um, he was a developer. So he goes, okay, I can do that. So a month later, he calls me up, and he's all excited. He says, Tom, he says, we got to talk about this. It's, I, I can't wait to share this with you. And I'm going, really? I mean, I mean, you do this all the time. So he comes in, and so we went through, and, and I said, uh, so uh, did you do everything I told you to do? He said, absolutely. I spent, I spent, you know, four or five, I said, four and a half, five hours a day, every day, um, looking at real estate. And so, you know, I documented it and he asked me, he says, the deductible, I said, yeah. And so we figured out saving about four, $4,000 a year, um, based on his trips to New Mexico. And I'm going, yeah, $4,000. Um, I know you don't like paying taxes, but that's not going to get you this excited. I said, tell me the rest of the story. And cause I just knew there was something else going on. He goes, well, turns out I was, I was, because I was doing what the government told me to do. Basically he says, um, I found a deal. He's all excited about the deal. I said, tell me about the deal. He says, the development project. He said, I think this is going to net me a million dollars by the time I'm done. It'll be a net of a million dollars. So I'm going, so, so John, um, how long has that deal been there? Is this a brand new deal? And he said, it's been there for years. I said, why didn't you find it until now? He said, I wasn't looking for it. Yep, so see. By, by doing what the tax law told him to do, he was, now he was looking for it. Okay, mm-hmm. so that's why I say the tax law, best way to make money is to understand and follow the tax law. That is absolutely the quickest way, easiest way to make money. You do what the tax law tells you to do, you will make money. And think about it from the government side. The government's given up $4,000. Let, let's say it doesn't find it the first year. Let's say it takes them five years. All right, so the government's given up $20,000. But they're getting taxed on a million-dollar deal. A, a million-dollar deal, I mean, even with good tax advice, he's going to pay $300,000 on that. 20000 in exchange for three hundred. dollars that's a good deal. Yep. Plus right, everybody so, else that's going to be involved in all the subcontracts. Exactly. And you, you've Tom got the multiplier Wheelwright effect. Tom the CPA is getting more money. Everybody's <laughs> eating, right? Everybody. That's right. And everybody's spending that money, right? Yep. So there's a multiplier effect. So so when our president-elect, um, you know, talks about, you know, reducing taxes can actually increase the the, the economy, you know, he, he, he's not wrong. I mean, you know, how much it can increase, we don't know. But... But it absolutely, I mean, the tax law has been doing that for years and years. So why would we think it would be any different now? Yeah, I agree with that. Jake, uh, any other questions you want to start in the second segment right now? Yeah, no, I think that, um, you know, you, you've been a very successful guy. So we like to talk about some personal things like habits. So what is a, you know, a daily habit that has really made you who you are? You know, a, a personal habit that that's, you know, set, sets you apart from other folks. Um, that's an interesting question. I don't, oh, man, don't think stu- I've been asked that one before. I like there. that. <laughs> um, it, you, you know what? I, I like to take time in the morning. I actually think uh, getting your day started right is, is important. So one of the things I do is I, I, I'm an early riser because morning is um, – it's just better time. You know, you, 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 you've got a good night's rest. You know, you're ready to go. You're not tired from the day. Um, I, I don't work in the evening. I never work in the evening. You know, evening is for reading and, and socializing, spending time with my, 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 my lovely wife. And, and, you know, that's, that, that's relaxing time. I, I do not, I, I'm not, a, I'm not a night, I'm not a night person. So f- first thing in the morning, I want to get my day started right. So I'm going to, I'm always going to read. Okay. I'm always going to caught up on my news. I'm going to read, you know, I'm, I'm always going to have something good to eat in the morning because I want, I want that energy that's going to get me started during the day. So, um, you know, I, I really think it's my mornings that make the difference for me is, um, and, and if I don't get that, I mean, like when I'm traveling, it's really hard, you know, and I, I traveled actually three months this year, uh, three wow. months. Uh, yeah. I, I was actually around the globe three times this year with Robert and, uh, you know, that's hard because, you know, you don't have your routine and, and, and so you kind of get out of it. And so you, you can't, you really have to work hard. You know, the, my friend Blair Singer, who is a, a rich dad advisor, one of Robert's close friends, um, Blair travels 10 months of the year oh, kill me. and, 
and and that guy, yeah, that guy is in such good shape. I mean, he's he's doing mountain climbers every morning, right? He does burpees. I mean, he he's got this this whole physical routine, and he never varies, and he never varies on on what he eats. So, you know, I, I'm not that good, right? I you know, if I were traveling that much, I I would hope I would be that good, but I I actually. Um, love being at home. I'm, I'm, Me too. I'm a kind of a homebody, and and my li- wife loves being at home, and we love being at home together. And we had some great traveling. We, I mean, we were in Africa this year, and we were in New Zealand this year, and we were in Paris this year. I mean, so you know, it's it's hard to you know, it's not like I'm complaining about the travel, but I am saying that you know, on a daily basis, you know, those routines that you establish, I just think routine is very important. R- routine makes us comfortable. It, 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 you know, if we have a positive routine, it can be really good for us. If we have a negative routine you know, yeah. can be really bad for us. So, you know, if your routine is, you know, the, the minute you, you get off work, you sit in, in front of a, on a couch, you know, watching TV and you're, you know, you're eating chips and, and drinking beer, you know, for four hours a night. I mean, that would be a negative routine, right? But, you know, you, you, you're preparing a good meal and you're, you're socializing, and, you know, you're doing some really positive relaxation, you're reading, stuff like that. Uh, I'll tell you something that Robert does. So, um, so now I've shared, shared what I do. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you a secret about Robert. I, I don't think there's anybody who studies as much as Robert Kiyosaki does. Um, Robert is always reading, and when he reads, he does not read a book. He studies a book. I mean, he has tabs on it. He's highlighted. He's discussing it. I mean, this guy is, is the best student I've ever met. Okay? And I think makes that's sense. what makes I think that's what makes what makes Robert great is that he's such a great student. Makes and sense. it's funny, he hates school. <laughs> or he hates it, school, it, but it's not it, traditional education it, is more, it, more appropriate. It, it, that, that's what it is. I mean, you think about it. I mean, what does he do for a living? I mean, he's an educator. Yep. You know, it's pure and simple. He's an educator. He's just not a boring educator. And he's educating on things that matter, mm-hmm. right? I mean, not, I, I'm sorry, but taking a biology class is never going to help me in my life, yep. right? Now, I actually think some of the math classes do. Algebra, you know, basics, you want to, you know, learning to read. They've actually established that um, people who don't learn to read by, um, by third grade um, have like a, a 70% chance of, of failure in life. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's really, you know, so there are certain fundamental things that we need in school, but, you know, I'm not sure that biology and calculus are, are two of them. Mm-hmm. And I actually discovered this whole you know early riser thing this year. I started getting up at six, where before it might have been you know seven thirty or whatever. But I have a home office and I work out of the home, so at six I literally come down, you know, grab the espresso and I'm working right away. And I get a three hour jump on almost everybody else. So I'm three hours into it when everyone else is just getting started. So I think that's huge. And I don't I don't stop at three. You know, I keep going until you know whenever the work's done that day. So I think that's huge. And I really discovered that this year. So. That to me, that's the benefit. One of the big benefits of that. So, so, so let me tell you a tax benefit of doing that. Yeah. So, so if if you start in your home office, yeah, and you end in your home office, Every all day your I travel do. during the day, yeah. all your travel during the day is deductible. Yep. Because wow. because remember that the first the first the first commute you have a day is commuting. It's not ta- it's not it's not deductible. So if you go off to see a a, a real estate property and you don't have an home office, that that drive to the real estate property is not deductible. But if you started at your home office, your commute's 30 feet. Yeah. Okay. So there's a tax benefit to this too. So, um, just, you know, congrats is, uh, on the home office. Ezekiel, really just to keep it. feeding the beast, baby. Right? <laughs> 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 so so this, this next one I might already know the answer to, but uh, maybe you're going to surprise us. So why don't you share with us your best business book and why? Your most favorite, uh, most beneficial to you. All right, so this this one um, will absolutely surprise you. Okay. Uh, uh, my my best business book is called Untethered Soul. Gino, you know that one? No, I'm writing it down because I'm going to pick it up and read it. It is a <laughs> personal development book. It has nothing to do with business on the surface, but you know my uh, Blair Blair's always telling me he says you know the higher your emotions, the lower your intelligence. And um, Blair wrote a book called uh, Little Voice Mastery. And, you know, we have, uh, we have a, uh, the, the, uh, Michael Singer, who's the author of Untethered Soul. There you go, Little Voice yeah. Mastery. There I you got go. It. I got, I got right. both of his books. So. Great, great book. Great book. Little Voice Mastery is kind of a subset of Un- Untethered Soul. So Untethered Soul, Michael Singer, the, and he just put it beautifully. He said, look, we have a roommate living inside our heads, 
right? And our roommate's always talking to us, and it's always giving us advice, and we're, you know, we're always listening to it. And if we actually thought, if we actually thought and followed every single bit of advice, and if we had somebody else telling us that, we'd think they were absolutely nuts, and we would be, we'd be furious <laughs> with them. And yet we listen to it all the time. And I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. So, so we did a, a whole book study, um, the Rich Advisors did on Untethered Soul. Um, uh, a, a couple of months ago, and we're, I'm in Dubai, and um, this this um, Robert invites all those who play the cash flow game up on stage, and this this young woman comes up and she's um, uh, she's dressed in her traditional garb, right, and very um, very small. She's maybe five foot one and very shy, and she didn't join in with the group. And I said, look, go join in. Join in, you know, be part of the group, be part of the picture, be, be, be part of it. And she actually came up to me later afterwards and she said, thank you for, you know, pushing me into that. She goes, I tend not to do that. I said, well, that's, that's just, the, that's, we call that your roommate. You know, your roommate's just in there telling you to do that. I said, I said, um, I actually think I have multiple roommates. She goes, she looks at me, she goes, I've got a whole tribe. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I'm laughing so hard. I'm going, oh man, I'm never going to forget that one. I got a whole tribe of people telling me, you know, what to do and talking to me. And, and what Untethered Soul does is, what, what it's helped me with is it's actually helped me um, detach myself from that. And so if you observe it, you, you're always going to have the, the little voice in there. You, 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 you can't get rid of that, those little voices. That's part of who we are. But in, if we, instead, of, instead of being enthralled by it and, and following its direction, if we just observe it, then it makes all the difference in the world. So um, Untethered Soul is really about taking a step back and, and really becoming who you really are. And, and what I found in business is that now it's easier to make better decisions because, again, higher emotion, lower intelligence. That means lower emotion, higher intelligence. Well, if you're observing, if you're not, in, if you're not invested in it, okay, from an emotional standpoint, you're going to make better decisions. And that's why I think, I think the key to good business is good personal development. I, I think that's the key to good business. If you want to be a better business person, develop your soul. There's no, there's no coincidence of that in people getting, uh, having all their, I guess, um, good fortune, all their luck happening in their early, late 30s, early 40s, because that's when you begin personal development. I, that's what happened to me. I went to life coaching school because I said to myself, am I doing what I want to do? And you start realizing it's not about everything else. It's about what's inside of you. It's You have right. all those external blocks. It's the internal blocks, 95% of them inside of you that are holding you back. The external is the government, the economy, or I like to say Obama. I can blame them all I want, but it's not them. It's really me. And I, that totally resonates with me, what you said. So I have to pick up this book. This is my next, this is my next election thank you yeah how can listeners get a hold of you and partner with your company if that's something that you know based on listening to this that that they're looking to do well thank you for asking that question that's actually one of my, that's probably my favorite question <laughs> i really want really to want to know um uh, actually if you go to um taxfreewealthadvisor.com um, taxfreewealthadvisor.com, then uh, you can actually get a, a free copy of Chapter 23, How to Find a Good Tax Advisor. Okay, so we'll, we'll give you a free copy of that, that chapter of the book, which I do think is the most important chapter of the book. I and, um, you, you know, and then in, you can contact us through there, or you can always call us. Uh, our number is uh, 866-467-5809, 866-467-5809. So um, you're welcome to call us. You know, we have, uh, we have a ton of information that, that, that's free. You know, when I wrote the book, you know, I mean, you probably paid $9.99 on Amazon, right? And uh, um, when, when I wrote the book, I actually asked my, my business partner, um, who was uh, our managing partner at the time, and I said, how much should we give away in this book? Because this is intellectual property. I mean, this is stuff that, you know, I've spent, you know, at, at the time I'd spent 30 years developing. He said, give it all, but don't hold back. And so everything, pretty much everything I know is in that book. Mm -hmm. And um, and I love it when people, you know, Gino, thank you for that that, that great, um, I, I find that very high praise say it's easy to read. I, I had a, a young woman who told me that it was a good beach read, which I <laughs> thought was hilarious. You know, seriously, a, a book with tax That's in the title just say, yeah. is not typically what I think of as a beach read. But but I actually wrote it. It's it's actually my personal history. I mean, if if if, if you look at all the stories, I, I just put my personal stories in there because I I feel like you know we ought to taxes. I think taxes are fun. 
Now, I'm a geek, right? So, I, I mean, I'm a total tax nerd, and I, I love reading the tax law. I, I love learning about it. I love new, new challenges like that. It's the most complex thing on earth. Einstein actually said that, it, that the most difficult thing in the world to understand is the, ta- is the income tax, and, uh, and, and I love that challenge, okay? But it doesn't have to be difficult. It can be fun. It can be easy. It can be understandable, and that's the whole point of the book, and, and I would just, uh, you know, and, and, and when you get it, and you've got a tax advisor that you like, like, just share it with your tax advisor. You know, this is this is not private. You don't have to come to us. You know, we're happy to have you, but you don't have to come to us. Go, you know, if you have a good tax advisor you really like, share the book with them. I've never had a tax advisor say anything. In, I've, I've never had a complaint from any tax advisor about that book. Not one. I've never gotten a criticism because everything in it is just right out of the tax law. I mean, it's, it's not like you know, in, in my mind, it's not rocket science. You know, so it's it's something that is simple. It's fun. It it takes effort, just like real estate takes effort. But but the rewards are extraordinary. When you think that 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 the average person is paying thirty to forty percent of their income in taxes. I mean, you, you know, I had somebody describe tax. When you think of the word tax, it's something that's a drag on you, right? It's mm-hmm. taxing, right? This is taxing. It drags you down. You cannot get to where you want to go and pay high taxes. It is, it is mathematically impossible to become rich while you're paying high taxes. It is mathematically impossible, unless you're a superstar, right? It's mathematically impossible. For the average person, it absolutely cannot happen. So you have to be reducing it. This is something you have to be reducing your taxes, and it's something you can do every single day, and it's really, really simple. I, I think and the NFL you- needs you. They need you to start speaking to the players. I, you know what? I'll and tell you what. I'll tell you a funny thing. So I actually, I actually, I actually have clients. I, I, I have I have uh, um, a, a good friend of mine, uh, Danny Shays, uh, was playing in the NBA for 18 years. Uh, uh, Dad, Dolph Shays, is a Hall of Famer. And, uh, uh, you know, he and I have actually uh, – we've, we've pushed that. And he's, of course, got really good contacts in there. The interesting thing is, man, those guys, they listen to their agents, and they don't listen to anybody else. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. they are like – uh, it's it's really interesting. You know, they're constantly talking about they're constantly talking about how they're losing money and and getting ripped off and everything. I'm going well, then get some better advice, would yeah. you? I mean, just get some education. And mm-hmm. some of them do, you know, and and they're good guys. I mean, this is the thing. These are really good guys. A, a lot of them came out of the ghetto. They've got really good opportunities, but so many of them, like you say, they end up flat broke yep. at the end of a you know in, in nfl it's a three or four year career not for right? long and, and they, <laughs> they make millions of dollars for three or four years and then they're done and, and what do they have and you know for most of them within a couple of years after that they're broke mm-hmm. so you're, you're right i mean they they do need they need you guys they they need education is what they need well jake the, the mark of a, a great uh educator is tom because he makes it simple he makes it easy um i've written a book review go on jake i reviewed his book i made it nice and easy i've given you some bullet points it's an easy book to buy go to amazon it's 14 bucks it's the best 14 bucks you'll spend throughout this christmas season i guarantee it so um, that's right start giving I, some I, education I, I, for the holidays right right Gino? yeah there you go there you go and if they want to listen to it i, I you know the the, the only downside, if you want the audio book, because it is, is an audio, is that you actually have to listen to my voice for 15 hours. No, that's that's BS because you got energy. That's what I'm, Listen, I have the most fun on the podcast when people have energy. You bring energy to the uh-huh. table, that's what I'm talking that's about. Right. So I, I don't that's believe right. that. Uh-huh. I did, I did guys, before we sign off, because we're running a little long, I did take some notes, and I'll put these in the show notes. But I loved when you're talking about the benefits of real estate. And the leverage and the ability to finance big properties with little down, I think that's fantastic. Uh, the, the, when you're talking about focus on cash flow, don't be thin on your cash flow. That's what we're all about. We buy for cash flow. If we get our cash flow right, the rest of it works out. And that, that's been our that's experience. Right. So that was awesome. And the way you explain cost, segregate, uh, cost segregation, i got to put you in contact with our cost seg engineer because – that was that was fantastic about you know how it was required by law less of an audit risk and you can do it at any time i think those things guys you know th- for the listeners out there very very high level stuff here and uh, and the the untethered soul will check that out so tom you are the man i had such a fantastic time thank you so much i did too was, thanks tom it was my pleasure absolutely thank you guys okay we'll talk to you soon take care bye guys okay.